At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. Well, hello and welcome to another Drug Science Podcast. I've waited a very long time for this one because my guest, Val Curran, has been elusive and challenging and difficult to get, traveling the world, being an international scientist, but she's here. And you'll understand after our conversation why I was so keen to have her on board, because she's not just a friend and a colleague, but she's also a remarkable scientist who's innovated research into illegal drugs and brain function in a way that I think no one else in the Britain or maybe around the world has done. And on top of all that, she's a founder member of Drug Science, and she's been a loyal supporter. She's always contributed to what we've done. And also, she's been wise counsel to me on many occasions, which means one of the reasons I've managed to stay out of prison. So so what are all those things, Val? Great to have you on the programme. It's an honour, Dave. Well, thank you for coming. And uh, as you know, what I like to do in these programmes is get people to to share their life, really, to get so people understand you know, how you get to be what is, I think, you know, you're probably the most senior psychology professor of psychopharmacology in the Britain. You might have even been the first psychology professor of psychopharmacology. But of course, it didn't start out like that. I think, as I recall, you were, you were a grammar school girl, weren't you? From up north, Manchester, was it? Yeah, not Manchester grammar, no, it's another called Wally Range Grammar School, it was for girls. And yeah, I was a grammar school kid who did well and went early to Cambridge. I uh, got into Cambridge early doing exams for it from school and did natural sciences. Do I recall you went to do maths? Originally, I was going to do maths, yeah. And then I realised <laughs> that natural sciences would be much more interesting because it had a whole load of options you could choose from. Interesting, because I did exactly the same. I changed before I went to Cambridge from from actually for natural sciences and medicine for the same reason. I wanted more flexibility. But I want everyone to know that you are a good mathematician because we rely on you a lot for the (laughs) randomizations and and all the trials that you and I have worked together on. We've used your mathematical and statistical now. So I want you to take credit for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I like maths. Yeah. But you changed the psychology then in natural sciences, did you? Well, you know, it's a tripod, so every year you can do something different. And in the second year, I did philosophy of science, which I loved, and psychology, which just bowled me over, experimental psychology. So for my final year, I chose to just concentrate on psychology. And I did my final year project on memory with Malcolm Piercy, who uh, was long retired. I don't know if he's alive still, but he inspired me. So I then went on to do a PhD focusing on memory but looking at memory development in, in children. So I was particularly interested in how culture affected that. Was that at Cambridge? Where was that? That was at uh, the University of London, what became the Institute of Education. And yes, yeah, so I, it, it also got me to, to travel abroad to Africa because I've always been into African art and African music. So I had not only scientific reasons for going, but pleasurable reasons for living in Africa for a while. Well, it's good to fuse the two, but what were you doing in Africa about memory? Were you looking at cultural differences or what? Well, I was interested in, in culture and language and how that influenced memory and especially development of memory in children. And so in terms of language, most of the world's languages are tonal so that what a word means depends on how you say it. So the most tonally developed language is Mandarin, Chinese which has five tones, which is incredibly difficult to learn. And perhaps the best other next well-developed tonal language is Yoruba, which has three tones, a high, a medium, and a low. And uh, so it means any two-syllable word can look the same written on paper, but it it can be said in different sing-song ways so that it could be six different words, six different meanings. 
And I thought that would have a pretty powerful effect on memory. So where, are, where do they speak Yoruba? In southern Nigeria. But it's actually, it's actually spread. They're a very large group of people. Where I live in Hackney at the moment, Yoruba is the second most prominent language to English. So you can, can you still speak it? I can still speak a bit, but very badly, very badly. Well, I won't embarrass you by asking you to show us your Yorubian on the, on the radio here. So you, you did your PhD and you came back. And how did you get into psychopharmacology then? Well, I did my PhD and then I, I got, in those days you could, I got a research council grant to go back. They gave me a fellowship from the Social Science Research Council to go back and do some more on this area because it was really fascinating. But on my way, just before I was going to go back, um, I got married meantime. <laughs> just before I was got, two weeks before I was going to go back, I found out I was pregnant. So I had to go to a homeopathic clinic to get my jabs to go back. <laughs> So I had various like, carrot juice injected. And yes, I went back and then came back to the UK to have our first daughter, Amy. And shortly afterwards, only 20 months after, was another daughter, Layla. And then we went, my husband was working for the BBC on a big series about martial arts in the Far East. And he was going to be gone for six months. And I couldn't face the idea of being on my own with two tinies for six months. So we all went together. And to cut a long story short, when we got back from Japan and other places, a really good friend of mine who's a professor in Cambridge, Susan Glombok, was at the time working at the Institute of Psychiatry with someone called Malcolm Lader. And a job had come up part time for someone to work on on some new antidepressant. Mm -hmm. And she asked me to go because she thought it'd be fun to work together, which I agreed. But I said, I have no interest whatsoever in drugs. <laughs> Just for you, I'll go along and have a chat to this Malcolm bloke. So I did. And I told him I wasn't interested in the job. And he said, well, you know, is there anything that would make you interested? So I said, more money, less time, <laughs> two days a week, not two and a half. And I'd need to be able to do my own research on memory to have any interest <laughs> in what was happening at all. And he said yes to everything. So, you know, and after I discovered few weeks later started reading up about benzodiazepines and I discovered here was this magic bullet instead of studying memory in the classic neuropsychological way of waiting for patients who had certain kinds of brain damage to compare to normal people here was something that I could give people that could make a healthy person amnesic for a limited amount of time and I could compare them when they're am amnestic with benzodiazepines with how they are normally. So I couldn't think of any better experimental design for exploring memory and its failures. So at that point, I was a total convert. I got really into it and yeah, didn't stop. <laughs> so it was my career. Well, you've worked on more than benzos, but let's stick with benzos in the short term because a lot of people don't understand the, the way in which you can use drugs to perturb memory and look at different elements of memory and the, and the pre-drug and the post-drug memory. And I think you did some of the earliest interesting work on the timing of benzos and the impact they have on, on memory. Do you want to share that with us? Well, I just brought all the skills I'd learned from studying memory in children um, to ask the quite interesting questions about drugs in the brain, especially as we're getting to know more and more in your own work on benzos about, you know, what benzos actually did in, in the brain. And so I, the work on memory that had been done before was really basic. It was kind of how many words in a list can you remember? And there was very little understanding in any of the drug world about how memory in humans has at least five different differentiable systems. Oh dear, I only thought there were three. You better elaborate this. <laughs> Why? But, you know, that, that nothing had been done on four of them. So it was kind of completely open. And so it was a great chance for me to explore really what's happening with, with the human brain when it's perturbed neurochemically. And that's what makes everyone, psychopharmacology is, people, every, you know, I always, people say, why are you a psychopharmacologist? I can say, because, you know, because the brain's a chemical organ and, and pharmacology is, a, you know, their tool, their, the pharmacology gives you the tools to explore that. And, and you've obviously support that theory, yes. <laughs> Maybe you invented of it. Of course. 
Yeah, you've also got the issue of a dose. You know, you can adjust how much you perturb memory. Certain doses will just perturb one system more than another until, you know, you reach a plateau. And, and you can really manipulate things like that, which gives you a fantastic window on the brain. Yeah, and I think you developed some international collaborations, didn't you, with a very famous American memory person, Herb Weingartner, right? Yes, yeah, I was speaking to him on Zoom last week. Yes, no, I collaborated with him because he was doing some of the more, much more interesting work, really, in the cognitive area. Yeah, so that was a very, you know, fruitful collaboration. But he was always interested in metacognition, wasn't he? The sort of memory you don't really, you're not trying to learn things, but things happen, you do learn things. It's, it's your own no knowledge of your own yes. memory functions and, and abilities, yeah. Which benzos have quite so, an impact um, on, is that right? Well, one particularly, lorazepam, turned out to be a much more interesting drug than other benzos in that respect. And it, it as you know, it's one of the most addictive. As, as, as you go up in potency, you go up in addiction to that particular benzo and memory effects of that particular benzo. Sort of go up in parallel. So and Xana, things like alprazolam, even more right. potent, yes. even more yeah. so. Yeah. Whereas things like diazepam didn't didn't have much effect at all on meta memory. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Isn't it? I mean, we could. Yeah, so that might be might be to do with the receptor subtypes, which of course weren't known in those days, but which are becoming more, more you know more obvious in terms of potential yeah. actions. But of course, you were working with Markham Nader, who was the the man who. I suppose started putting the nails in the coffin of Venzos. I mean, you were you were present on that period. Well, Martin wasn't very present. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he was all over the world, so we just got on with it without him. Alison Bond and I, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. So you did, did you ever study benzo withdrawal? I can't remember. Were you ever part of that? Yes, I did a lot of benzo withdrawal. Yeah, I, I mean, one of the first things I did clinically was to to work in the benzo withdrawal clinic. At the Maudsley. Oh, did you get clinically trained at the Maudsley then? Did you? Is that where you? Because you are clinically trained. I know that. Yeah, I mean, when, when I was working part time, it was an opportunity for me when my first two kids were at school to go and do clinical training, which I was just interested in the whole sort of mental health era, and I did it independently in those days. Which oh, okay. Good. All right. Yeah, so I, I did a lot of. I had a whole placement on on benzodiazepines and. Addiction and withdrawal. So you're a, you're a therapist as well as a psychopharmacologist. Do you still practicing? Yeah, I'm a clinical psychologist. So I, I did practice a bit, but really my heart was in research. So that the clinical training had given me a lot of, of helpful perspectives and made me much more interested in the whole interaction of, of memory, cognition with emotional well-being which was a big part of the last sort of 20 years of my life, I think. Again, with lots of different fantastic collaborators, fantastic PhD students and postdocs, and many of whom you know. I've been really lucky. That, that was at UCL. You, you, you moved to UCL from, from the Maudsley, is that right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the IOP in those days was rather kind of male-dominated and psychiatry-dominated, so female psychologists were kind of, you know, very secondary. And when I moved to UCL to join the clinical psychology part of that uh, university, it was it was wonderful, eye-opening, kind of, I loved it. It was so collegiate. People wanted to collaborate on an equal basis at IOP, you know. It was... Well, that's why it's called University College. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, it was, you know, it's the first uni to, in, in the UK to admit women, you know. Yeah. Whereas the, the IOP, you know, there was there were certain male professors, psychiatrists, who, if you asked to assess a patient, they would insist you had to sign an agreement that they could be a senior author on a paper that arose from that that meeting. It was extraordinary. Yeah. Well, I I hope it's changed now, but I've never worked there, so I can't be certain. Well, it doesn't happen at UCL. Yes. So, but did you you took your benzo work to UCL? Is that right? Yes, I did a big study on withdrawal of elderly people from benzodiazepines after they've been taking them, some of them for nearly 27, 30, up to 30 years. And what we did was a placebo-controlled withdrawal, which worked incredibly well. So we got, I think it was, it was something like 
88% of elderly people off their benzodiazepines after over 20 years by randomizing them to a placebo withdrawal at a certain point in time, so say three months into the study, or at six months into the study. And they didn't know when they were being withdrawn. And we would gradually cut down the dose of, of their benzodiazepines and substitute it with a placebo so it looked the same. And we had very little in the way of withdrawal reactions. The withdrawal reactions actually came at six months when they'd all been withdrawn. They, they knew they weren't taking anything. Well, yes, so they knew that. So we had to then go into all sorts of shenanigans about it was they realized they were no longer taking them, but they 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 missed taking something. So we kind of gave them sort of lavender pouches to put under their pet pillow and that kind of thing. And that, that kept them going. Yeah, I mean, that was quite a remarkable study because up to that point, there'd been a sort of assumption you couldn't get off benzos. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it, it was really the, the expectations were so strong in benzo withdrawal. You know, the suggestion that it's going to be difficult when actually we found hardly anything in the way of withdrawal reactions that you could attribute to the drug you know, using a design where we've got a complete comparison between placebo and gradual reduction in dosage. Clever, so, yeah. clever design. Yeah. I kept on with benzo research and I did some work with other people like James Blair on, you know, the effects of benzodiazepines on emotions, which hadn't really been studied before. And obviously that's a big part of their treatment effect, that if you show people on you give people a single dose of something like diazepam or lorazepam and you show them pictures of people displaying the basic human emotions including you know fear and anger and whatever is that benzos suppress their response to fearful faces and angry faces but not to happy or sad faces so that you know part of their action is via some action on perception of emotions in other people and we replicated that effect. So that was really interesting to see that, you know, they're not only just good in terms of memory, but they can also affect your emotional processing. But by then, I mean, one thing we didn't have at the Institute of Psychiatry in those days was undergraduates. And when I came to UCL, there were obviously hundreds of undergraduates that all thought working with doing their final year project on drugs would just be the bee's knees, you know. So I had queues outside my office of people wanting to do research. And, and one of those people was a guy called Ross Treville, who happened to, to, to make up his income by being a DJ at the Rave, just very near UCL, at the back of King's Cross Station. And so I said to him, is, is there any chance that, you know, your boss would let us set up a little laboratory there so we can actually study people taking MDMA? And he said, well, let's go and talk to him. So he went to this rave during the daytime and it, was, it looked quite tatty. And there was a little room off the, the dance floor and all the other bits of it that the, the boss said that we could use. And so that's what we did. And I did, I'd only just arrived at UCL at this point. And yeah, it was, it was really good fun. We, so we had you know various machines and whatever so we can get them to do psychomotor tasks and blah, blah, yeah. blah, as well as memory and, you know, questionnaires on emotional well-being. And we followed them through till the next day in their homes. And then a few days later when it was midweek. And, yeah, so, you know, Ross was fantastic. It's a, it a lot of hard work that he put in. And we compared people who were on the dance floor who'd, been, who'd taken ecstasy with people who were on the dance floor who'd only taken alcohol. Because we couldn't get, it was, there, was, there was nobody there who hadn't had anything. Yes. <laughs> and, yeah, and the results of that were, because hardly any research had been done on MDMA in the mid-90s. No. And so the results of that were that we've got, it, it fitted with a kind of serotonin profile of what MDMA does, in that we found that the biggest difference in how, depressed people were emerged midweek so that the the people who'd had alcohol didn't have any depression but the people who'd taken mdma were significantly more depressed 
And so we said, you know, something of a midweek blues that fitted with a serotonin depletion that would occur about that time. And we published this in uh, Addiction. And it was quite extraordinary because the phone, the minute the press release went out, the phone started going and it just came non non-stop forever and ever in my office. So after a kind of eight hour day, I just took the phone off the hook and went I went for a walk in Bloomsbury just to get my head back together again. They really took it to extremes, you know, and it was all over the press. Well, you gave them what they wanted. You're a very bad girl. <laughs> they wanted to find her. Dave, I only gave them what I found. There's nothing else I can. Yeah, no, quite. No. But just, just, let's just look at that a bit. I mean, I think people probably don't understand the how innovative what you did was. So you actually went to a place where people took drugs uh, in the real world and did studies on them. I mean, there are two two things just to elaborate a bit. Firstly, why didn't you do it in the laboratory, do it properly? Uh, and, <laughs> and secondly, how, you, how, you, how come you were allowed to do that? <laughs> well, I, obviously, I, we got ethics to do it. So ethical approval of the study. Was that easy or did, they, did the ethics push back? No, ethics at, UC, at UCL is, is really professional. It's, they're really good. And, you know, the people on the board are scientists mostly. And, you know, in, in a sense, it's unethical not to do it, given at the time in the mid-90s that so many people were taking ecstasy. Why, why on earth not look at what it's doing to them? Because we need to know. You know, if it's doing any harm or, or whatever, so I think it's it's unethical to ignore these things. And I th I've always said to all my students and researchers and whatever, you know, in science you have to be creative. If you're not creative, you'll just do boring old science. You know, churn out twinges on the same old methodology. Yeah. Just be creative and think of how you can get at something that's really important to the public who are living in the current age. So that's what we've always done. We've always gone out to the people where <laughs> drugs are, as well as done, obviously, challenges in the lab and in, you know, a lot of brain imaging work. Yeah, no, I mean, that. I guess that was the first. I mean, you, we'll come on in a minute to the other studies in the real world that you've done. But but let's stick with MDMA for a bit because uh, I really want, to, I want you to tell the listeners about your... Uh, Wonderful experience in court in New York. Shall I introduce it, or do you want to? As you like. I mean, I can introduce it. I was. Yes, do tell the story. It's a beautiful story. It started off a few years before the court case when I was over at the U.S. Congress talking to politicians. When one of the politicians wanted to introduce an act which would stop what what he saw as a proliferation proliferation of ecstasy among young people and to this they invited a guy called George Ricorte who was a great orator and had done a lot of work on rats and some work on monkeys and he claimed that he found evidence of neurotoxicity in the brains of these rats and monkeys at doses that he argued interspecies scaling would mean were equivalent to what young people were taking. I argued that we don't know how it does it in humans and interspecies get scaling is not an accepted methodology or a reliable one and that there are so many other factors just considered in humans that you can't make a direct statement that this compound is, is neurotoxic. So we kind of differed so that when after, just after that, Ricorte's influence was very strong and they put up what they call the marijuana equivalency of ecstasy, MDMA. So in the States, every drug has a marijuana equivalency, which is a kind of ruler, if you like, that determines the sentence you get for dealing or even possession of that particular drug. After Ricorte's speech and people looked at his publications and all the rest of it, they decided to increase the, the sentence you got for, for being in possession of ecstasy or dealing ecstasy to a level at, at the same level as, as cocaine. Now, the American Civil Liberties Union, a few years after this, then decided that people were being put away for, in, in prison for long sentences when the drug, you know, when they asked me, I said, well, people don't get addicted to ecstasy. 
Whereas lots of people get addicted to cocaine. Cocaine has lots of negative things on your cardiovascular system. You know, it's it's nothing like as, as problematic as cocaine. So they then had a case where two people had been caught in possession of large amounts of ecstasy and had been given sentences according to this marijuana equivalency being the same as cocaine. So they, the AC, American Civil Liberties Union got myself and John Holpen from Harvard to fight a case in court in New York against Andy Parrott and I can't remember the guy who was the head of NIDA for a while. And we had this court case and I spoke for hours. And in the end, so the, the judge was a really intelligent man who I was impressed by how he took on board the science and the complexities of, you know, pet imaging and all that sort of thing. And he came out with what I thought was the correct decision to say that the marijuana equivalency had been completely overblown and it was out of all proportion. And he reduced it by 60%, which means that after that, if you were caught with ecstasy, dealing ecstasy, then you had 60% less of a sentence to serve, which I was really proud of because, you know, being in prison, as, as you know yourself, I mean, you've publicized this more than anyone, being in prison is more damaging than taking most drugs, you know. I'm very envious, Val. I'm, ve I'm proud of you, but I'm envious. I've never managed to change any, any, any policy of any drug other than the, to make it worse. But you, at least in America, managed to, to save an awful lot of people from long periods in prison. Well, I think you're being too modest, Dave, because you, you did have a big impact in Australia recently in getting them to have psilocybin and uh, MDMA accepted as a uh, Oh, that's true. Yeah, fingers crossed that'll treatment. come through in the 1st of July, yes. But uh, that's a big achievement. You took on NIDA. Not many people, a <laughs> few people take on NIDA and win. But, so you, and of course, you know, you came uh, as a result after that, we got talking about the brain effects of, of MDMA, and you, uh, you very helpfully put together that study that we did showing that it did have that imaging, you know, effects to suppress amygdala activity and that. that. But we did it on Channel 4, which was also uh, remarkable. Yeah, and again, I mean, testimony to the fact that UCL was, was quite as open-minded about communicating science as well as... Uh, yeah, and, and our, our ethical committee, I can't, I can't speak any more highly of. They're, they're fantastic. No, yeah, absolutely. And, and, of course, that then uh, that led us to go on and do the, uh, the other one, the, the Cannabis Live one. Yeah. But before we talk about that, what made you morph from MDMA into cannabis then? I've never seen myself move from. I've, I've continued some work on MDMA. I still do. And, you know, the, the other two things after that were really the big things in, in my work with my fantastic collaborators have been ketamine, actually, and cannabis. And all the way through, I've looked at alcohol and other drugs like that. But the cannabis, I think, I've always been interested in. And I think one of the, the the major influences on that was Celia Morgan, who's been a fantastic, you know, PhD student and postdoc, then she's now a professor at Exeter herself. So she's had a wonderful career. And the two of us were in Santiago in Chile at a conference. And Celia got chatting to Antonio Svardi, who is a, a very famous person in the cannabis world. And he, we'd been working on cannabis at UCL together, and he mentioned his work on CBD, cannabidiol, altering the effects of THC in animals. And so when Celia got back, she had a look at our, some of our data um, where we had people who'd taken all sorts of different drugs. And we'd taken hair samples because we were always trying to find different ways of measuring drug use. It's quite a complicated thing. You can't just ask people to, to, to tell you if you want a decent measure. So she looked at data we had and then and divided it up according to whether people had THC in their hair, whether they had THC and CBD in their hair, or whether they had neither. And the results of this were really neat in that it showed what Zwadi had suggested was that CBD moderated the effect of THC on psychotic-like symptoms 
in these people. So if you had THC and CBD, you were like people who had neither. And both groups were much better in terms of having lower psychotic type sim symptoms than the people who had only THC. So I think that one finding really started us off on a, a long line of research looking at how you can manipulate the effects of THC with CBD and what kinds of effects are manipulable and which kinds of effects are not. It's not, it's not an easy, simple thing to explain. The results vary quite a lot depending on how the drug is given or, you know, the kinds of, of cannabis that's been around. I mean, cannabis has changed in CBD content dramatically over the last 20 years. There's virtually none in the, in the street cannabis you can get now. And the latest <laughs> data we have was that we, from one of our studies canteen, We've been really lucky in having huge MRC support for all our cannabis work. One of our recent studies has shown that the actual cannabis, when we sent that off to be analysed, these young people, adolescents as well as adults, they were having samples of cannabis with 30% and plus THC, which is huge. When you and I were at university, it was about 4% THC in cannabis. And now it's just zoomed up. So it's a very different drug from what we used to know. So the study you're talk the study you described earlier is, was a was a really important study for two reasons. Just because again, it was done in people's homes, and you did the testing in people's homes, and then you measured the effect of people using different forms of cannabis in, in the real world. And that probably I think was published in 2008 in the British Journal of Psychiatry. I still use the slides. I use the images from that paper because. They showed then the really dramatic increase in psychotic experiences in people who were using THC without CBD. Yeah. But what did the government do? What happened? They just pursued policies which pushed and pushed. So, you know, three or four years ago, they, the policy had pushed THC levels up to about 15%. And now you're telling me it's about 30%. So, Well, in some of the samples, yes, yeah. I mean, what is that doing to young people? You know, 37%. Potency, but it's all been driven by by the policy. You know, there's there's no need to have cannabis that strong. I mean, it's uh, we've just by trying to eliminate cannabis, we've just grown this monster of of super strong skunk, and of course, you know, spice as well. And so, I think your paper is one of the most neglected, most importantly neglected papers there there's ever been. In fact, one of the other interesting things about it, I don't know if you remember, is that. Um, is that the group that they used the mixture, the THC CBD mixture, had had better scores of hed uh, hedonic pleasure than even the ones who weren't using anything? Oh, I'd forgotten Which that. Which kind of makes sense of why. <laughs> yeah, it's a small effect. It was significant though. Yeah. Because it argues why people use cannabis because they do actually quite enjoy it. Ex exactly. Yeah. yeah, we've been looking at that more recently in the canteen study about why people use yeah. and yeah, and, and looking at their pleasurable experience while on the drug. All oh, right. Can you? Is there anything you can share, or is it too early? Uh, we, we haven't published it yet, so I don't want to share too much. And we'll no, we'll, okay. try. well we'll look out for that. So the wonderful will will produce. Yeah. Well, let's stick with cannabis for a bit before I move on to ketamine. But sticking with cannabis, you you also were um, the CBD amelioration of THC is obviously fascinating in terms of policy and possible, but it's also relatively interesting in terms of treatment and. You did a major study looking at CBD to help people who are dependent on cannabis. Do you want to share that with us? Yes. So that's, I mean, one, one aspect of it is, is, as our 2008 paper showed, is that CBD is, is a useful adjunct in the treatment of clinical psychosis, which other people have shown since. But in terms of its effects on all sorts of psychological processes involved in addiction, so that the extent to which your attention goes towards stimuli that are, are related to the drug you use. We had lots of evidence from that sort of experimental work that CBD could be an antidote to some of the effects that are part of a, a profile of addiction. And so we got funded by the MRC to do a clinical trial where we gave cannabidiol to people who had severe cannabis use disorder or cannabis addiction, as most people would call it. 
And we did this. I mean, Tom Freeman and I did this together with some fantastic other researchers. And what we found, we looked at three different doses of cannabidiol taken every day for a month compared to so three doses compared to a placebo treatment. And what we found was that the mid, a middle dose of 400 milligrams a day was um, effective in alleviating you know, cannabis ad- addiction, reducing can- cannabis addiction. So that was a very strong, interesting finding, which is now being followed up in Sydney, Australia, and other parts of the world. Oh, a trial point. Yes, yeah. Why aren't we doing a trial in the UK? What, or are we trying to tee the one up here as well? We haven't gone on to, to do that. We could have done. Tom's involved with the Sydney uh-huh, study, okay. and they're using one of my measures. Well, you've developed a scale of cannabis dependence, haven't you? Tell us about that. Well, it's not, it's not fully developed yet. The analysis is going on at the moment with Ollie Mason in, yeah, and a student of his. We do have to scale because at the moment, scales of cannabis dependence are all based on people who take the drug recreationally. And it's not going to be the same effect if you're going to look at people who are taking it med- for medical reasons. So we wanted to create a valid measure of cannabis dependence in people taking the drug as a medicine. So we developed the measure, and at the moment we're in the, the course of validating it and looking at its reliability. And once that's done, which will be in the next six months, then we can go ahead and publish the results and give people access to the, to the questionnaire itself. So just for the, the, the listeners, we're piloting your questionnaire in 2021 as well. So yeah, we're getting some data from the Drug Science 2021 initiative on that. 2021 is, is, has, is fantastic, as you know. And, and we're piloting this questionnaire with, I mean, there are over, what is it now, 5,000? No, it's 3,500. So, yeah. 3,500 patients, yeah. So, you know, they're doing it repeatedly every three months, a questionnaire. So, yeah, we're hoping to get some data, some results soon to see if we can cut it down, if there's some items that aren't that reliable or whatever, but just just to finesse the questionnaire so it becomes a, a, a valid measure and picks out where people may be having problems. Yeah, I think it's important to emphasise there's a lot of prejudice against cannabis. <laughs> And one of the arguments that we've heard many times about rolling it out for medical use is it, it'll make everyone dependent and psychotic. And uh, <laughs> the good news is so far in 2021, we haven't seen anyone psychotic. And we're no, going to find out from your scale about the dependence. So that's... <laughs> well, so I've, I've looked at the early data and, you know, this, there might be a, a small subgroup who have a problem. But whether the problem is is not as bad as what, what it would be like for that person without the cannabis is an issue, so especially if you compare it to op- opiate issues. Well, yes, indeed. Yeah, where they where we're finding medical for those who don't know, medical cannabis in twenty twenty one is helping people reduce their opiate painkiller use. Before we finish on cannabis, I've got to ask you about John Snow. Tell <laughs> tell the listeners what you did to him. It was one of the, one of the funniest things I've ever seen. <laughs> Oh dear. Well, well, John Snow was involved in both the, the MDMA and the, the cannabis programs that Channel 4 made at these documentaries. And he's, he's a wonderful guy. He's quite a workaholic. So that when he came, we were doing the imaging at UCL and he insisted on coming to be imaged at five o'clock in the morning so that he could be ready for his news bulletin come 10 o'clock, he wanted to be over the effects of cannabis by the time he was reporting the news. So we had to get, you know, I I had to go in, I had to get there for five o'clock and then give this poor guy different types of cannabis. So we had placebo, we had THC on its own, and then we had THC plus CBD. And not not many, (laughs) I think he was maybe 70 when he was doing it, people you know, could can take and face a drug at that time in the morning. But we gave him one treatment and put him in the scanner shortly afterwards and and he clearly couldn't take it. He was getting very paranoid and very anxious in the scanner. We had to take him out 
And we, we spoke to him. There was Matt Wall there. There was Rebecca. There was various researchers there with me. And we spoke to him. And, you know, he said it was a worse experience than, than he'd had, you know, being in terrible war situations in the Middle East and other parts of the world. He'd much rather be there than be in the laboratory or certainly be in a, a brain scanner. Well, certainly, yeah, that's a bad combo. Yes. A, a, a lot of catalysts without CBD in a brain scanner. That's a, yeah. a lot of things have together to make things a bit uncomfortable. But you have to give it to him. He was very game. You know, he kept on coming for the yes. next two sessions. Yes. No. Yeah, got through the whole study. Well, that study was remarkable because it, I think it's really one of the very first studies that has actually compared THC with a balanced CBD THC mixture, and it, and yeah. it clearly showed different uh, different effects on the brain. And that paper's published relatively recently by Wall et al. Yeah. If you look at Wall and Curran, you'll find it. Well, let's move on to ketamine now. Um, what, what got you interested in ketamine? Apart from the fact by then you were so familiar with the uh, the London underground rave scene, you know that <laughs> you got a free pass. Is that right? <laughs> No. What got, got me into ketamine was Celia Morgan, actually. When she was an undergraduate at UCL, I was giving a lecture to the, the I think she was in her second year of them, and she came up to me after the lecture saying that she would really like to work with me on her third year project. And she looked in those days, <laughs> she looks very different now, but she had a lot of piercings and crazy clothes and whatever. So she looked really, really good fun. And she was passionate. And she said all about, you know, knowing all these people who use ketamine and that we could work with them and, and do a project with them. So we did we did do that. And Celia was fantastic. We tested them when they weren't on ketamine. And then I think, oh, I can't remember, we've done so many studies, but the original one, I think she just looked at, at the ketamine users when they'd used and when not used. And yeah, we got, I mean, ketamine has very, very strong cognitive effects you know it's really potent in terms of its effects on memory and on on several other cognitive functions and also emotional processing so Celia did her project we published that in addiction and then yes she went off to to do a, a study for a year with another person at UCL and then we got her PhD grant and yeah, she did a, her PhD mostly on ketamine. And at that point, we, we started collaborating with Brigitte Brandner at the hospital, UCLH. And we were able to give ketamine there with Brigitte, who's an anaesthetist. Yeah, Brigitte, I should say, is also another member of the drug science. Uh, also part of drug, drug science. science you, know. yeah. you brought her into drug science. Thank you. He's a fantastic person, a great scientist and a fantastic clinician. Yes, and so that was the start of uh, of all the work on ketamine, which uh, Celia is still doing. I mean, Celia went, now, I mean, now as a professor, she's working with with drug science and and looking at ketamine for alcohol use disorder. Well, that's people might think that a bit confusing. You're talking about ketamine destroying the cognition, and now we're talking about ketamine as a treatment. Do you want to clarify that people might get a bit confused as to what you're saying there there's a theory worked on by Ravi Das and Sanji Kamboj that uh, ketamine destabilizes memories so if when you're trying to retrieve a memory it becomes temporarily manipulable and if you put in ketamine which acts on NMDA receptors which are very important in this memory process you can exaggerate that effect so that you might be able to impair that memory or re reduce it a lot so that a more adaptive memory can take its place. And we know that with uh, alcohol dependence, that you know, such kind of memories are, are very important maintainers of a, a, an addictive pattern. So there's a whole idea that you can manipulate retrieval processing with giving it a drug so what Celia did was to try and destabilize the memory in the hospital, either under the influence of, of ketamine or placebo, and under the influence of an active psychotherapy versus a placebo psychotherapy, which was just an educational kind of input. 
And she found that the, when both active treatments, i.e. ketamine and the active CBT-based therapy were given together, they got a better response in terms of people not going longer without have, without using alcohol again after the trial. These are all people who are alcoholics, yeah. I mean, that's quite impressive, isn't it? You know, and it, I think there's a sort of a bit of a theme going through your, your career. You're, you're taking demonized drugs and then exploring them and discovering they actually do have some merits, which gets me on to the very last uh, comment, because, you, of course, you've also been intimately involved in our work with psychedelics. You were part of the group that actually did the first trial in depression. I, I remember vividly uh, psilocybin going to the ethics committee, trying to persuade the ethics committee that it was ethical to do this. And uh, you and Steve Pelling, you know, you're two great leaders of, of research in, uh, in clinical research at UCL. And, uh, you know, I think bit touch and go whether we actually were going to get permission, but it, uh, we did and it worked. And yes. It opened. <laughs> the rest is history. <laughs> well, let's hope, let's hope it's not going to be consigned to history anyway. So when's the canteen study going to f come out? When are we going to eat off it? <laughs> It's coming out. It's like a paper every couple of months at the moment coming out, written by the wonderful canteen team. And yes, the longitudinal one about, yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a huge study that it's going to take a long time to get all of the papers out. Yeah, no, it's an amazing study that you've done. I mean, again, do you want to just briefly to finish, just explain to people what you actually have done in canteen? Because I think it's, it's a bit mind boggling in terms of the scale. Yes. The main emphasis was really that the, the brain's own cannabis system, which we call the endocannabinoid system, is really important at various points in the a child's maturation into adulthood, and particularly so in adolescence. And because of this change in the cannabinoid system itself, we hypothesize that if somebody takes in cannabis, so an exogenous cannabis, you have your own cannabinoid system, obviously internally in your brain, that that could then interact to produce benefits, harms, whatever, in terms of the developing brain. And so what we did was to get together a large number of adolescent cannabis users and matched people who don't use cannabis, so non-users. Um, so these are people who were 16 to 18, 16 and 17. And then we had uh, adults of, of, this, of sort of 10 years older, roughly, who, again, the two groups who used and didn't use. We basically compared them longitudinally over a 12 month period, where we did everything in terms of biological markers and cognitive function and emotional processing and brain, yeah, brain imaging with Matt Wall. And yes, compared the two. I mean, and, and at the moment, and we, all, we also did a study where we, a bit like the Channel 4 study, where we administered single doses of THC, THC plus CBD or placebo cannabis, and looked at uh, whether there were differential effects on adolescents and adults. And I suppose one of the things that's emerged so far of the papers we have published is that adolescents are much more likely. If these are people matched with adults and adolescents are matched for the quantities of, of the frequency at which they use cannabis, the adolescents are still much more liable to become addicted to the drug than adults. This is the thing that's emerging more than anything else. Well, it's vital that we have proper dispassionate quality science in this field because it's been uh, dominated by politics and opinion exactly. for so long. So. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, oh, it's been a pleasure. Obviously, I'm going to say keep up the good work. <laughs> yeah, well, it's been great working with you over the years, and Drug Science yeah. is very grateful for your for your inputs. No, I'm honoured. I'm honoured to be part of Drug Science. Long may that continue too. Thank you so much. Yeah, and, and your work as well. Amazing. Thanks, Val. Okay, thank you so much.